Good evening and a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us in this news broadcast. We have a lot of stories that we've lined up for you, but first things first, let's look at the highlights. Tonight, tens of security officers deployed in Kamaindi village, Tharakanithi. You cannot kill a human being like a chicken and you be let go. Five other suspects to be held longer as investigations continue. And billions allegedly spent on state house functions, South Sudan peace efforts and free primary education by Kiambu County. It is only appearing as, as a temporary misuse. You cannot come here and start telling us you are disowning a document that you have come up with. Why even state house does not want to be associated with Governor Waititu. Also tonight, one billion shillings already spent container clinics lying idle in Mombasa. Some of the containers, they are only full of chairs and another container is full of uh, bars to do the canopy. Contractor and Health Ministry now want 600 million shillings more to complete project. Plus, former ethics PS Githongo ordered to pay former internal security minister 27 million shillings for libel. I'll stand by it until the day I die. It is what happened. MTV Tonight with Dennis Okari and Sbriti Vidyarthi. It's nine o'clock. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our sign language interpreter is Rafael Mbalo. To our top story, and the Senate Public Accounts Committee has ordered the Auditor General to undertake a special audit on the 2017-2018 financial expenditure of the Kiambu County Government. The committee questioned the credibility and quality of the auditor's report after it gave the county a clean bill of health despite financial statements indicating that the county had allocated 973 million shillings for the coordination of state house functions and other places unrelated to the county. For the first time since he was elected Kiambu governor, Ferdinand Waititu appeared before the Senate Public Accounts Committee. It is here that Waititu found himself in trouble after the financial statements he had tabled before the committee indicated that during the 2017-2018 financial year, the county had allocated 973 million shillings for the coordination of state house functions and another 58 million shillings for the peace process in South Sudan. Coordination of state house functions. Mm -hmm. 973,839,449. Below it, administration of statutory benefits for the retired presidents, 180,506,800. These are budget lines for Kiambu County government, not national government. The TC owns that document. You, and, you have and, the document that you have all the information. You uh, cannot come here and start telling us you are disowning a document that you have come up with. Unless there was a special request, maybe the governor will tell us from the state house to, to chip into the budget. Maybe the state house is trained. We have not spent any money in state house or southern Sudan or uh, free education. We didn't have any budget for that. It is only appearing as a, as a temperate misuse you know, from Treasury. However, State House has distanced itself from Waititu's woes. Through his Twitter account, Chief of Staff Waitan Zioka has insisted that State House does not share any budgets with the county government of Kiambu. The financial statements also captured an expenditure of 804 million shillings for free primary education. Members of the committee questioned why the financial statements were in variance with the IFMIS statements. That is strange to those figures. Well, those figures are contained in this audit, audit, audit query, which you have confirmed you responded to. Because I don't know where they came from and uh, what I'm seeing today from my senator and the other senator here, I, it's something that I expected. Point, point I, I knew they could have used this opportunity to try to uh, punish uh, the name of my administration without justification failed to provide besides that members of the committee questioned the credibility and quality of the auditor's report after it gave Kiambu County a qualified opinion without questioning the monies spent on national functions 
a report that was done by auditors who worked on the report on Nairobi County, where their credibility was also questioned. This is really embarrassment to the government when the account of State House is under Kiambu County. And the Auditor General has not captured this. It's really shocking. According to the committee, there is fear that over 2 billion shillings has been spent on services that have not helped the residents of Kiambu County. The committee has also directed the governor to table his written responses on auditor's queries for the 2015, 2016, 2016, 2017 financial years within seven days. Vincent Odur, NTV, Nairobi. The Ministry of Health and Estama Investments Limited want Kenyans to pay 600 million shillings to distribute and install the mobile container clinics. Now, the portable clinics that were procured by Estama Investments Limited back in 2015 at a cost of 1 billion shillings in what later turned out to be a scandal have been lying idle in Miritini in Mombasa County. The National Assembly Committee on Health inspected the containers at the NYS yard and discovered that some of the equipment supposed to be inside is missing and some have been vandalized. NTV's Coast reporter Kevin Mutai reports that the MPs maintain they will not approve any money until the containers are dispatched to respective counties as per the contract agreement indicated in the tender document. Where are the microscopes? Because these are an empty box. The microscope should have been here. The situation at the National Youth Service Camp in Miritini, Mombasa, Thursday noon, when the Committee on Health inspected the controversial 1 billion shillings mobile container clinics and some of the equipment supposedly installed in the containers was found missing. The prices for these containers were really exaggerated. 10 million shillings? 10 million for such kind of a, just such kind of a container. The containers have been rotting away slowly since the first batch arrived in the country in 2015. The Ministry of Health has disclosed that there is no money to transport them to the counties even after Estama Investments Limited was given a down payment of 800 million shillings to supply, deliver and install the portable clinics. Things like microscopes, they are only the empty boxes. We believe that they have been vandalized, the microscopes are gone. Uh, we have looked at uh, some of the containers. They are only full of chairs. And uh, another container is full of the bars to do the canopy and the seats. So for me, it is a total mess. The committee claims that the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission had investigated the procurement of the equipments and cleared the supplier while ignoring the fact that the Kenya Revenue Authority had revealed that the firm spent 1.4 million shillings to buy and import each of the container clinics and then sold them to the government at 10 million shillings each. The containers were allegedly supposed to have been assembled in the country, but the supplier ended up procuring them from China. The Ministry of Health has claimed that they have inspected. So that inspection report, particularly physical report, also we want to avail. Kama sisi kama kamiti ya suwa tumekuja hapa kuona kiti ya kwanza, ile pesa selikari lilipa, selikari lilipa nini. But this has been a thorn in the flesh. But I think we have come to a conclusion that this was a shoddy job deal. Kenyans have lost money. The MPs met with officials from the Ministry of Health and Estama representatives, but still they did not find common ground as they were denied access to crucial tender documents including delivery notes. We are disappointed as members of parliament for what we have seen. And I can assure you, even if this container is taken to wherever they want to take them, at the end of the day, Kenyans will have to go back and dig bigger into their pockets to make sure that the containers are working. The ministry, however, plans to employ health workers and attach them to the clinics despite the role given to county governments. Upon their inspection, members of the health committee in the National Assembly say they are not satisfied with what they have seen, maintaining that their report will contain many questions that will be demanding for answers from the Ministry of Health. Kevin Mutai, NTV, from Meritini in Mombasa County. Absolutely shocking and certainly a story that we will be keeping close tabs on. Elsewhere, former Ethics and Governance Permanent Secretary John Gidongo has been ordered by the High Court to pay former Internal Security Cabinet Minister Christopher Murungaru 27 million shillings after the court found him guilty of libel and defamation. 
Urungaru sued Gidongo 13 years ago, accusing him of destroying his political career by intentionally defaming him. Well, Gidongo, then the ethics of PS, had linked Murungaru to the Anglo leasing scandal that cost taxpayers 5 billion shillings. Ken Majungu now reports that Gidongo says he is very disappointed with the ruling and has begun the process of appeal. 13 years, three judges, and tens of lawyers later, the defamation case against John Gidongo rested. He is guilty of libel and damages have been awarded to the applicant, Chris Murungaru. It's a dis disappointing uh, in that, uh, of course, one would have wanted to see the, to, for, for the court to find uh, differently from where they have found. Mm -hmm. But yes, um, uh, I'm surprised. Uh, Gidongo, who takes issue with the court's decision, says some of his witnesses were never afforded an opportunity in court, one of them being ODM leader Raila Odinga. Okay. I'll stand by it until the day I die. Mm. It is what happened. Mm. Yes, a person uh, does not um, um, take the kind of action I did without a lot of uh, reflection and thinking. The High Court directed Gidongo to pay the former minister 20 million shillings in general damages, 5 million shillings in exemplary damages, and 2 million shillings in special damages. Uh, the models of, of stealing public money uh, that I was struggling against when I was in government and I've continued to speak about since I left government, mm -hmm. have continued. And it, it is unfair for, for ordinary Kenyans to continue to suffer that load. He says this ruling will not deter him from fighting and talking about corruption. He says Kenyans continue to carry the weight of the thieving public servants, something that is unacceptable. He stands by his revelations, which were then christened the Gidongo dozier, where not only Chris Murungaru was named, but a host of other top government officials, some who lost their jobs and others who were cleared and made a comeback. Some of them, like Finance Minister David Miraria, have since passed on. Emos Kimunya, who replaced Miraria, told the court in 2016 that he had no power to cancel the Anglo leasing deal. During his testimony, he told the court that he met with former Energy Minister Simeon Yachai and they discussed the high level of corruption in the Internal Security Ministry, where Nyachai informed him that Murungaru was involved in the scandal because his ministry was involved in corruption and that all the information linking Murungaru to the scandal came from from third parties and not him. Gidongo also told the court that he had tape recordings of their conversation with his sources, who included current Meru governor Kiraitu Murungi, Ken Mijungu, and TV. A security operation to flush out suspects believed to have murdered Chief Jafet Makau Mukengu of Kamaindi location in Tarakanithi County on Tuesday and Chuka Osius Joseph Kenyo yesterday in Karurumo is underway as authorities seek to apprehend culprits involved in the murders. Five suspects arrested yesterday on suspicion of murdering the chief were remanded by the Chuka Law Courts for 15 more days to allow investigations into the bizarre events. NTV's Melita Olatengis with the details. In Mugweri and Kamaindi, it was not business as usual today. Even as detectives conduct a probe and an operation to flush out suspects that are believed to have taken part in the murder of the chief here in Kamaindi and that of the OCS in Karurumo, this is the situation here in Kamaindi. Locals have closed shop and fled the center, afraid to be pointed out as one of the suspects. Homes too remained deserted as police vehicles roamed the sparse terrain, conducting a door-to-door -door operation, trying to piece together information that may lead to the arrest of suspects connected to the two deaths. We already have seven suspects in custody. Uh, for the case of uh, Chief, we have five who uh, were taken to court this morning. Uh, for the case of uh, OCS, we have two already who have surrendered themselves to the police, and we are asking the rest to surrender. In Chief Makao Mukengu's home in Kamaindi, there is no one on site. Here too, the police found no answers to whatever questions they may have wanted to ask. 
Chief Macau was attacked by a mob Tuesday evening in Kamaindi village as he sought to solve a trespass case in his brother's home. He was hacked to death by irate locals who touched his body afterwards, linking the chief to the murder of one Gitonga Kibuibe who went missing late last year with his body discovered three weeks ago in River Tuchi. Chuka OCS Joseph Kinywa, who was effecting an arrest following leads at a butchery in Ugweri in Embu County, was hacked by a suspect who he had shot. The OCS was cornered and lynched by a mob as a police informer escaped with serious injuries. Wanaishi wanataikana kuwa human. You cannot kill a human being like a chicken and you be, be let go like that. So we, we expect uh, harsh action against the community who did this or against anyone found to have done this. Five suspects were in the dock today at the Chuka Law Courts. The prosecution asking the court to detain them for 15 more days to allow further investigations. It's in the interest of justice that the application by the prosecution be allowed to give the prosecution and the police time to conclude the investigations. Chief Macau is not the first administrator to die in the line of duty in recent times. In December last year, Dirib Combo Chief Bida Godana was killed at a funeral of a police reservist in Geresa Marsabit County. In July, Chief Peter Kimiti of Kamakwa location was shot dead by unknown assailants at his home. And Todo Nyang Chief Ekal Lochamin was shot dead by suspected Merile bandits from Ethiopia in the same month. Milita, Olitenges, NTV. Now, city lawyer Asa Nyakundi will spend more days behind bars after the director of public prosecutions asked the court to withdraw a case against him and charge him afresh. The office of the DPP says it is not satisfied with the charge of manslaughter preferred against the lawyer who's accused of killing his son. NTV Silas Apollo with this latest development that now presents a new twist in the case. In what could mean an introduction of tougher charges against city lawyer Asta Nyakundi, the prosecution today moved to court to ask for another date to present its case afresh. The team led by prosecutor Stella Oyagi argued that the charges of manslaughter leveled against Nyakundi were lenient compared to the nature of the crime he is facing. Prosecutor Yagi today told Kiambu Senior Principal Magistrate Teresia Nyogena that the prosecution team had received fresh orders from the Director of Public Prosecutions, Nurdin Haji, to re-examine the case. The file is being reviewed by the DPP. I therefore pray that we maintain the mention date of 10th of May. The bone of contention in the matter is what investigators say is a deliberate attempt by officers tasked with the investigation of the matter and arguing it in court to omit key evidence and documents in papers filed before court. Part of the documents omitted, according to the Director of Criminal Investigations, George Kinoti, are the ballistic report, scene of crime analysis report, and photographs of the scene, and which has since seen two officers, including Senior Sergeant John Wahome, who led the investigations interdicted. The ballistic report, which Kinoti says form part of the crucial documents in the case, contradicts some of the testimonies given by Nyakundi that he accidentally shot his son. The report says that the shooting must have been a deliberate one, given the angle through which the bullet hit the late Joseph Bogonko, as well as the direction it exited his body. Nyakundi has on the other hand maintained his innocence, saying the pistol in question went off accidentally while he was trying to retrieve it from the co-driver's seat. The city lawyer was previously been linked to some of the high-profile crime cases in the country, including the NYS2 and a murder case involving controversial city preacher James Nganga, could now spend more time in police custody. Some of the witnesses lined up against him include his wife and son, both who have already recorded statements with the police. This year, George Kinoti says that part of the investigations will be on why key evidence was omitted in the final documents submitted before court a matter that could see officers implicated charged alongside Asanya Kundi. Sailors Apollo, NTV.
to another investigation where three suspects believed to be behind the death of a family in Kericho have been charged with robbery with violence. Simon Sigay, Simon Rotich and Leonard Korir were charged before senior resident magistrate George Kimanga in a Kericho law court. Tension brewed at Kericho Law Courts as family and friends of the deceased awaited a ruling after the suspects behind the murder of their loved ones were brought in. The three are the key suspects in the death of Bernard Langat, his wife Khadija Langat, and five year old son Abel Kipkoech. It is believed that the suspects broke into the home of the deceased in Melit village, Kericho County, at night on the 1st of April, killing the family in cold blood before they made away with the woofer, mobile phones and money. According to the neighbours, the gang broke into the home through the window. Simon Sigay, Simon Rotich and Leonard Korir were charged with robbery with violence. First accused, Simon Sigay was also charged with an offence of being in possession of stolen goods as he was found with a stolen woofer valued at 10,500 shillings on the 9th of April 2019 at Londiani Junction with other documents that belonged to the deceased. They denied the charges and are being held at Kericho GK prisons, awaiting bail ruling on the 7th of May. Helen Aura, NTV. Elsewhere, all outdoor gambling advertisements as well as television gambling adverts between 6am and 10pm have been banned. The Betting Control and Licensing Board further seeks to ban all gambling ads on social media platforms. NTV's Mel Miendo reports that all betting companies have a deadline of the 30th of May to strictly comply with the directive. The dust has not settled for betting companies. In fact, a storm is brewing as the government has stopped all gambling advertisements between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. quite literally. In a statement sent to newsrooms, the Betting Control Board through Acting Director Liti Wambua issued a ban on almost all forms of advertising that have been run by gambling firms to woo consumers of what has become a multi-billion shilling enterprise. But as the government has sought to close in on betting firms, new measures will now see the companies lose many billions. The betting board has issued a ban on all outdoor and social media advertisements on gambling. And not just that, but TV gambling ads have also been restricted to air between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. That's not all. The board further burned endorsements by celebrities in gambling adverts. This will see the likes of McDonald Mariga, Joey Muthengi and others lose their million shilling contracts with betting firms. The betting board stated that any form of advertisement of gambling must be approved and such an advertisement must contain a warning message about the consequences of gambling, including its addictiveness. This warning message is expected to constitute a third of the actual advertisement and be of the same font. The directive is intended to curb issues of addiction, the board stating that gaming is a demerit good and all demerit goods have the potential to harm the customer with the possibility of leading to addiction as well as some disorder. The new directive comes exactly a month after Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi announced that all licenses of betting firms will be suspended effective 1st of July this year and will only be renewed once they provide proof of tax compliance. Let me not lie, some of you will be out of this business soon. What are we raising our children to do? What can, kind of country are we building? Are we raising our children and telling them, just do nothing with your life, just go around betting and become a millionaire and live well? Is that the kind of thing that we are telling our country and our children? The number of cases we have to deal with of suicide in this country, out of this desperation, we must say no. Amidst the taxation wars with the government, all betting companies now have only one month to comply with the new directive on their advertisements. Mel Miendo, NTV. Back to security. The National Police Service has launched two new helicopters in a bid to enhance the capabilities of the police air wing. The new choppers, inspected by Inspector General of Police Hilary Mutiambai, include one configured for VIP use 
and another for advanced mission operations. Mtembai, who flew in one of them uh, with journalists, said the advanced mission helicopter is equipped with a camera capable of scanning car number plates and zooming into individuals in a crowd within a range of at least five kilometers. He was speaking at the Wilson Police Air Wing, and Mutimbai further stated that the government is determined to improve capabilities of the police, noting an increase in the number of functional aircrafts from three in 2013 to 11 at the moment. All right, well, great improvement there. Um, pretty shocking that from all the way up there, they can zoom in to an individual space. This is an improved one. There's one that they also got for the Rekus for that has almost similar capabilities with more enhanced features, though that is undisclosed. They say they can't give everything away. But perhaps <laughs> you, being our editor for investigations, have the inside yeah. inf has the inside information. <laughs> but I won't question you on that. All right, let's take a break now on NTV. More when we come back.
welcome back. And we go to the courts now where former National Lands Commission Chairman Mohamed Suzuri has been released on a seven-year shilling cash bail or a 15 million shilling bond. Well, this after the High Court reviewed his bail and bond terms following an application by his lawyers opposing the trial court's ruling by Chief Magistrate Lawrence Mugambi, who had issued a 12 million shilling cash bail and a 30 million shilling bond. Suzuri's lawyers argued that the early terms were unjust and unconstitutional. The High Court, however, only reviewed the bail and bond terms but maintained all the other terms by the trial court. The prosecution had opposed the review, arguing that Suzuri had not demonstrated that the bond terms were unreasonable. Well, uh, other officials then released on the reviewed terms include former NLC Commissioner um, Emma Njogu, former Chief Executive Officer Tom Aziz and Dr. Salome as well. In the administration of justice, the, the Chief Magistrates in this case spoke of coming, yet these considerations must be balanced with the constitutional rights of an accused person to bail, which is linked to his or her constitu constitutional right to be presumed innocent. Now, the High Court has given former Nairobi Governor Evans Kidero temporary reprieve after staying proceedings in a 213 million shilling graft case. Justice John Onyego says the case, which is coming up for hearing before the Chief Magistrate's Court on the 6th of May, will have to await his ruling. Kidero, through his lawyers, moved to the High Court, claiming that the charge sheet presented in court accused him of conspiracy to defraud the county of 213 million shillings is defective. Bigori County Secretary Christopher Rusane has been detained for four more days. He took plea today afternoon following his arrest by ethics and anti-corruption officers. And the county official is facing abuse of office charges in which he pleaded not guilty to the charges before the senior chief magistrate. He will remain in custody until the 6th of May when the court will determine his bail application. He was arrested on Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. by ESCC detectives from his house in Nigori town and driven to Kisi where he was locked up. Now, Pauline Chesang, a Nyeri-based magistrate, is to be remanded at the Athi River Police Station for more than 27 days, or rather for 27 more days, after a Machakos court ruled against her application for bail or bond on Thursday. Justice David Kime suspended the application for bail until witness statements and other bits of evidence are provided on the 29th of May. Justice Kime directed that the case will be taken over by Justice Odunga on the said date. And two police officers, two security guards and a taxi driver have been charged with stealing from various Barclays Bank ATMs. Frederick Harman, Daniel Okindo, George Njoroge and John Otino were charged with stealing 2.8 million shillings on the 16th of April at Barclays ATM at the Kenya Cinema Plaza in Nairobi. The four face another count of conspiracy to commit a felony of stealing the 2.8 million shillings. Patrick Nyoike, a taxi driver, was charged with stealing 1 million shillings on the 20th of April at Barclays ATM, situated at Mata Hospital in Nairobi. Well, from the courts, we take another break. We'll be back with more stories.
Now, the taxpayer, that is you and I, will have to shoulder 151 billion shillings worth of interest payment on foreign loans in the next financial year, a 46% rise from payments made in the current financial year. Estimates from the National Treasury project that this figure will rise to as high as 170 billion shillings over the next three years. According to budget summary statements dated April 2019, interest payments made towards the Exim Bank of China and servicing Kenya's Eurobonds issued in 2014 and 2018 topped the list accounting for 46% of all interest payments scheduled for the financial year 2019-2020. In the same period, the largest increase in interest payments on foreign debt is said to be witnessed in payments to the European Investment Bank, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi and Israel. Significant declines in interest rate payments are to be experienced in payments made to Citibank, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and Canada. In its budget summary statements for the financial year 2019-2020, the National Treasury says it intends to maintain a presence in the international capital markets through issuance of debt instruments such as diaspora bonds in a bid to meet the anticipated budget deficit of 608 billion shillings. This helps to explain why annual interest rate payments on foreign debt are projected to rise to as high as 171 billion shillings over the next three years. In the next financial year, which will lapse in June 2020, interest on foreign loans is expected to account for 27% of the amount designated for settling interest payments and pension demands by the National Treasury. This marks an increase from the 21% reported in the preceding financial year and signals the growing burden of paying interest on foreign debt on the national coffers and by extension on the heavily taxed Kenyan. And elsewhere, a proposal seeking to review the term limit of individuals serving as board members in cooperative institutions has been strongly opposed by leaders in the sector. The proposal is among the various interventions in the draft National Cooperative Development Policy, which has been fronted by the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Cooperatives, which seeks to read the sector of mismanagement, which has seen members' funds embezzled. Here's Lillian Carrier with more details on that story. The policy document, which was last revised 22 years ago, is set to put an upper selling for the term that board members of cooperative societies stay in office to 10 years, comprised of two five-year terms. According to several leaders from the sector who spoke to NTV and requested anonymity, the proposal is illegal as cooperative societies are autonomous in nature. The leaders express their displeasure at those who have endorse the final draft of the document which is set to be ratified in a meeting this Friday. The leaders have set up a meeting next week to give their position on this document. The policy will also see the powers of the Commissioner for Cooperative Development and various officers regulating the movement and enforcement of the law in cooperatives reviewed. The ministry is also pushing for the establishment of guidelines for vetting of cooperative leaders. This will entail a background check on the education levels of the leaders, their years of experience as well as their age. These parameters, if strictly adhered to, could eliminate many current leaders of SACOs from their positions in the board. Under the new policy, county governments will be tasked with registering county-specific cooperatives, auditing them and carrying out inspections into the affairs of county cooperatives. The role of the SACO Society's regulatory authority, SASRA, which has been limited to regulating and supervising deposit-taking SACOs, will also be expanded if the policy is adapted as it currently stands. Lillian Kierie. NTV. And away from cooperatives, Kenya's floriculture sector can best be described as ever blossoming owing to the country's top tier ranking as an exporter of fresh cut flowers to the international markets. But with the rising competition both regionally and globally, the future seems not so rosy for investors who say the ease of doing business in the country is deteriorating. In this Labor Day special, NTV's Bridget Ngana spoke with the people behind the roses which earn big bucks for the country and gathered insights on what ails the subsector. 
For 18 years, Rose Makambi's eyes and touch as a flower receiving and quality checker in this flower farm in Joro, Nakuru County, have ensured the clients in Europe where most of these fresh cut flowers are sold get the very best and on time. I first started bunching as a buncher. Then my boss recognized I was bunching quality flowers. Then my boss promoted me to be a quality checker. For Rose, a teacher by profession, her satisfaction comes from the empowerment her work has given her in the duration that she has served here. Nimefanya hii kazi, nimenunua shamba, nimejenga, nimevuruta stima, nimevuruta maji, nimesomesha watoto wangu size wako university. So I'm just happy about it kwa sababu ngapaje ni kidogo, lakini it has peace. I enjoy, I enjoy An estimated billion stems of flowers land in Amsterdam from Kenya annually. And from the flower hub, they penetrate into the vast European continent. According to the Kenya Flower Council, by the close of 2017, Kenya exported flowers worth a billion shillings. And as lucrative as that sounds, the growers who are the employers say the times have been tough for their pockets. The old generation used to buy a lot of flowers, but the young one at the moment, they are not in the business of flowers. Yeah, so that is why the demand and supply has really changed drastically. Also, if you check on the euro, the way the trend has gone, it has really changed. The buying, that hedge of buying is not there. Apart from the ever-growing competition locally and beyond the borders, the flower sector, which employs close to half a million people, is also never shy of the negative publicity as far as workers' safety is concerned. But that, some of the growers say, has since improved. I don't think there's any organization or any establishments more regulated than flower farms. We come in as experts, environmental experts, safety experts, in advising farms on how to comply with the statutory laws which are there. For instance, here at Expression Group, we are conducting air quality monitoring for them. About 2,000 personnel are on this farm every day. It has had to conduct frequent tests to assure the workers of their safety and health. Another thing you might, you'll note around flower farms, especially this one, there's a lot of birds, there's bees, which shows that in, in terms of environmental management, the environment is actually good. If you go and do an analysis, you might be surprised. Greenhouses, the air quality inside greenhouses is actually cleaner than in your air, the, the, the air in your vehicle. Even so, with every year the cost of life rising, the workers can only hope that their pay may increase, despite investors in the sector saying that the business environment in the country is growing cold to their needs and the country may just witness capital flight and job cuts. Our fear is that as we continue to increase the cost of doing business and impose new levies, then companies have to make a decision. How many people can you retain in employment and still run a profitable business? That's our joy. You know, even adding salary, it's one way of motivating you. Prospects of better days ahead are also dimming since the success of the industry is dependent on the favorable give and take between the government and the investors. The fertilizer and the pesticide costs are really huge amount which we spend. So if the government can come in and assist, maybe the exemptions of the VAT which have been involved, it will assist so that the cost can go down. So in the future, I foresee a possibility of uh, the, the industry being self-regulated. For instance, if, if you see in the, in the developed nations, most of this chemical research is driven by the by the users. Kenya is known all over the world for many things and among them are fresh cut flowers as a leading exporter to the European Union. Of concern is the welfare of workers like this and most importantly how much they take home at the end of the month. It is hoped that with the bettering of the economic status of the country that these workers too will be able to benefit from the hard toil in the farms. Bridget Ghana and TV Nakuru. And that story by Bridges Ngana wraps up the business bulletin tonight. Up next is the financial report.
48 megapixel Oppo F11 Pro. Now, a couple have won an all-expenses-paid trip to Mombasa, courtesy of Bonfire Adventures, and all they needed to do was watch their favorite TV station, NTV. The couple is among other winners who walked away with shopping vouchers. Anita Nkonge has the details. A lucky couple checked into the Pride Inn Flamingo Hotel after winning an all-expense-paid trip to the coast, thanks to NTV's Watch and Win promotion and Bonfire Adventures. The couple was flown from Nairobi to Mombasa where they will spend two nights and three days. Our top VIPs in the hotel for the next two days they are standing here 
courtesy of NTV and we are delighted to have them. Nakua hapa most kukuja na dege. Yoni kitu ya kwanza most exciting thing. Jai bebo nayo. Ana fry sana. Elsewhere in Nairobi, eight other lucky viewers went home with shopping vouchers after answering simple trivia in the NTV Watch and Win promotion. I'm favored. I said, and oops, I received a call from NTV and I was like, Jorogi, are you serious? Then I had trace and I was like, wow. Go to Dubai. My son wants to go to Dubai. Simply look up for questions every hour on what you have watched. The questions will be as easy as A, B, C. Alafu unachukua simu yako. Reply one or two. Ukianza na word win. Two, two, zero, six, eight, six. An all expense paid trip to Dubai is still up for grabs for what promises to be the ultimate trip for that lucky viewer. Dukes. Dubai International Maneno. Meeting and Conge, NTV. Well, well, well. You know what to do for that long deserved break to travel somewhere and just go relax for a couple of days, right? Yep, all you're going <laughs> to do is watch and win. Stay tuned. Uh, the sports news is coming up in a moment.
Arbitration for Sport, CAS, to uphold the IAAF ruling on athletes with high natural levels of testosterone continues to generate mixed reactions across the globe. Meanwhile, the global athletics body that has defended its decision to change the format of the Diamond League starting this season, which has led to the scrapping of the 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters races. The ruling by the Court of Arbitration for Sports, CAS, that female athletes with high natural levels of testosterone must take medication to reduce it has been welcomed by the global... Others opt to sit on the fence given the complexity of the issue. Firstly, I don't want to be um, quoted on the CAS decision because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not um, CAS herself, and I'm obviously not um, in that department, so I don't feel like I. <laughs> Remember that Margaret Nyerera is also one of the athletes who may be affected by this uh, ruling. And also, Athletics Kenya, which is a body that runs athletics in the country, is yet to comment on this issue, even as people across the world continue to talk about this issue, which is generating a lot of buzz. We'll keep you up to date with that. Uh, but now let's move on. And a week after the national team that uh, represented the country in the under-18 and under-20 African Athletics Championships staged a sitting demanding the allowances, uh, the national Paralympic team that flew Kenya's flag to the fourth international athletics meeting held in Marrakesh, Morocco, blocked the thicker superhighway demanding their dues. The team, comprising 54 athletes, arrived back home on Tuesday and was stuck at a hotel on Thika Road waiting for their allowances despite harvesting a total of 42 medals among them 11 goals. The actions of the sport people bring to the fore the issue of sports funding and also the importance given to sports by the government even as Kenya parades itself as a global sporting powerhouse. In the big city marathons, focus is usually on the big name athletes. Case in point, in Sunday's London Marathon, all eyes were on eventual winner Eliud Kipchoge. But to a keen observer, in the initial part of the race, there is a line of runners wearing identical stripped vests who control the pace of the race. Pacemakers are employed by race organizers for world record attempts with specific instructions for lap times. Given the depth of athletic talent in Kenya, in most marathons, the pace setters are known in the athletics world as a rabbits are Kenyans. The pace setters for the London Marathon are back. <laughs> Go 
scored an injury time goal as a defending champions goal Mahia came from 3-0 down to draw 3-3 with KCB in a six-goal thriller. Kenyan Premier League match played at the Kenyatta Stadium in Machakos. This has Bandari pipped a visit in Ulinzi Stars and Karubangi Sharks date with EPL side Everton has been confirmed. Kenyan Premier League defending champions Gor Mahia were looking to extend their lead atop the standings when they lined up to face KCB. Kogala found themselves 3-0 down after half an hour with Bolton Omwega scoring twice and Martin Dorito adding one. Goals by Samuel Onyango and captain Harun Shakava reduced the deficit to 3-2 for Kogala before the break. And there was late drama as Burundi and Francis Mustafa scored with the last play to ensure the sides shared the points with a 3-3 scoreline. <laughs> Gore now have 59 points from 26 matches, while KCB remained 12th with 31 points. First half, lacking lack of concentration. Uh, we come here, it's like my players, they think, was doing training sessions. But we change it, we, as soon as we've done the changing, the, we, we had the control. Disappointed on two counts. I think uh, when we went 3 0 up, we should have controlled the game better. That is one. I think also the officiating. When uh, they scored the second goal, eh, the Fari had already indicated one minute. So it was already one minute and about 30 something seconds. In Mombasa, Bandari beat Olensi Stars 1 0 at Mbaraki, with Yema Mwana's second half header proving the difference. The win sees third place Bandari take their points tally to 48 after 26 matches, while Olinsi stay eighth with 36 points. Meanwhile, English Premier League side Everton will in July face off with Kenyan Premier League side Kariobangi Sharks at the Kasarani Stadium. Currently ranked 10th in the KPL standings, Sharks earned the right to play Everton after beating compatriots Bandari 1 0 in the final of the 18th Sport Pesa Cup tournament held in Tanzania earlier this year. This will be Everton's second visit to East Africa, as in 2017, the Toffees beat inaugural Sport Pesa Super Cup winners Gor Mahia 2 1 in Dar es Salaam. Sean Carter Villis, NTV. And across the borders, uh, Portland uh, Trail Blazers are uh, beat hosts uh, Denver Nuggets 97 90 in game two to even the NBA Western Conference semi final series at one ups. CJ McClum scored uh, 20 points, and Kanta had 15 points and nine rebounds, with Robin Hood adding 15 points. But now back to Smriti and uh, Dennis. All right, Warode, thanks very much for that sporting update. Of course, more sport tomorrow. But that's where we leave it. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. Have yourself a good night. I'm Dennis Sokari. Our sign language presents tonight was Rafael Balo. Have a good night.